And now, for the first time in HCRG history, fasten your seatbelts and extinguish all your smoking materials, folks. It's gonna be a bumpy, intense, non-stop in your face series of roller coaster rides unlike anything you've ever fucking experienced. That's right, folks. Mega Man 8 alongside X4, X5, and X6, all for the PS1, circa 1996 and 97 concerning the former title, and 97, 2000, and 2001 respectively concerning the latter three. For these babies, I'm definitely using and bringing back my trusty PS2 to be precise. Mega Man! This 32-bit caper opens with an interstellar duel between two ruthless robot warriors engulfed in comets, eventually resulting in the two being forced onto the Earth's surface via its gravitational pull due mostly to the fatal scars they've caused. Meanwhile, beyond said surface, yet another duel takes place between none other than both our eponymous Blue Bomber and his conflicted rival, both voiced by Ruth Shiraishi, who also voices X and X4, and Daryl Stoger, respectively. Mega Man, today we finish this. Hey, Zach, why must they fight you? We are not enemies. Shut up. Eventually being cut short by a reminder from Roll, voiced by Michelle Gazipas, who in addition to briefing her brother with yet another important message from their creator slash dad, instantly whisks him away, thereby not only pissing off base in the process, but flat out putting the stubborn ass dickhead on thin ice. Dr. Light, what is the problem? A strange meteor has fallen to Earth just a while ago. This meteor seems to be emitting a powerful energy signature. Something this powerful must not fall into the hands of evil. I understand, Dr. Light. I'm on it. What does this message entail, you might ask? His latest mission, should he be ballsy enough to accept it, is to investigate a deserted island upon which a meteor, in the form of one of the aforestated fallen robot warriors, has crash-landed, and other peculiar evil energy readings stemming from it. However, as we're about to witness, his habitual stuck-up douchey arch-nemesis genius Dr. W beats him to one of these. Okay. <laughs> Thus, his latest, soon-to-be-fleshed-out exploit unfolds. Ready. Gameplay procedure-wise, isn't it obvious? It's all diddle yet again, just like the last seven. Here, our intro stage involves infiltrating said remote island, littered with mechanical hermit crabs that roll around upon taking damage, namely the Aminers, the standard Mets or Hard Hats, and other miscellaneous foes, complete with a secret underground passage, accessible via the randomly unearthed Skull Gates. The Mega Ball makes its debut here, acting as more than a secondary weapon. It's also used for pulling off higher leaps in tandem with said primary function, and makes a well-deserved return in Marvel vs. Capcom. But that's a different case entirely for another time. Take note, the Mega Ball must also be replenished periodically, again like all the Master Weapons and Miscellaneous Rush Gadgets, which refill automatically in between stages just as they did last time by the by, even upon death no less. And since it's a PS1 game we're dealing with here, though the Saturn controls might be different from this, Triangle and Square are for firing both normal and charged buster shots upon holding down the former indicated button down for a few seconds and releasing as per usual, with the latter indicated button for special weapon deployment. X and Circle are for jumping and sliding while holding down on the D-pad, or analog stick whatever applicable, as well as swimming while underwater, at least in this game's case. You're also free to quit at any time by going to the weapons menu and pushing select, cause the PlayStation for shit's sake. But then again, why even bother? And must I mention yet again that the shoulder keys are also used for swapping the special master weapons at will? In this particular case, L1 and R1, while L2 and R2 do fuck all, and you can still fire off your standard arm cannon while being equipped with said alternate weapons. With the rudimentary setup out of our system, at the far end of the opening stage lies a derelict yet artificial giant shelled crab boss by the name of Yato Cargo, who, aside from your traditional buster, is also susceptible to your new Mega Ball. <laughs> A 
pot obliterating its screwy scrap brain ass. Again, has jack shit to do with Sonic. <laughs> that earlier discussed plot point comes into play, as expected. Except Dr. Light briefs our pint sized plasma powered hero on more info regarding more of the evil energy samples after Wily makes off with one of them. Now the world is mine! Gotcha! At this juncture, when who the hell could have guessed? The customary quote unquote pick one of the first half of Robot Masters to put out of commission once and for all, followed by an intermission level after which the next half are accessible procedure comes into play. Our target cast this time around Grenade Man, Frost Man, Tengu Man, Clown Man, Aquaman, not to be confused with the DC superhero inspired by Marvel Submariner, and finally Sword Man, Search Man, and Astro Man. Let's do it! I'm Grenade Man! As far as the significant changes to the framework, the bolts are only found in plain view or in an obscure hidden space within specific stage areas, except in the Wily Tower, within which there aren't any checkpoints as opposed to everywhere else by the by. Like, way to fuck us over again, Capcom! Rather than from exterminating various common enemies, and are used to make crucial item parts at Dr. Light's lab, accessible in the stage select screen, at least half of the Robot Master stages feature mini-boss confrontations before reaching the halfway point, and upon wiping them out, an all-new assortment of Rush abilities and or vehicles are awarded to you. The Rush Cycle, Rush Item Roulette Search, Rush Bomber, and Rush Health. For much faster traveling, Kaneda, meet your new hot riding partner. Having him summon a random item, or plain jack shit, in which case he'll end up conking out, and even hurl a shitload of bombs, as well as energy and weapon recovery items, whilst flying Flying left and right in a wavy line before vanishing, singularly, largely due to the absence of E tanks in this particular entry. Also, don't even freaking get me started with those infuriating and repetitious rocket powered snowboard sections, both in Frostman's domain and Wily Tower Area 1, during which you're not only free to migrate around and attack, there's two basic but crucial actions you'll be instructed to perform more often than not. Hence, these voice modulated instructions heard like so. Jump, jump. Fly, fly. Jump, jump. Trust me, you'll be hearing these a lot, and they'll get on your nerves more often than your first ever fucking newborn child. Moreover, expect a lot of Christ awful, egregious bottomless pit plummets, and or sudden hazard exposures if your timing's far from on the mark. Hell, it's no wonder that the input lag is evident in the anniversary collection, but at least the board sections in the former announced area are walking the park compared to the latter. Did I forget to mention that there's auto-scrolling, shmup-inspired sections in both the second half of Tengu Man's stage, as well as in Wily Tower Area 2, during which you can also summon the returning Gato, Beat, and Eddie for more strenuous combat-heavy support? Christ, even G.I. Joe's a gang of pre-kindergartners compared to these four. Welcome back! Getting to the 17 crucial items you could purchase in Dr. Light's lab, depending on how many bulge you've rounded up, there's 40 in all stages by the by. While some are mandatory, others aren't worth a shit, and must all be equipped before they take effect. First and foremost, there's the Power Shield, which scales down post-damage knockback for 6 bolts, the Spare Extra, which allows you to start and even continue with 4 extra lives instead of 2, also worth 6 bolts, ditto for the shooting part, which allows up to 5 normal buster shots on screen at a time instead of 3, then there's the Energy Balancer, which instantly refills special weapons in need, even while not equipped with them, just like in 6 and 7, worth 5 bolts, the Returning Exit Module from 7, worth 4 bolts this time around, allows, as always, warping out of any previously cleared Robot Master stage at will, and then you've got the Laser Shot, Arrow shot and auto shoot, all of which are worth 5 bolts, and fire off any fully charged buster shot in the form of a beam, thereby decimating the hell out of multiple enemy groups, including shielded sniper Joes and the like, a light powered arrow that splits into 6 energy orbs, and a volley of instant automatic rapid fire buster shots upon reaching full charge status, thus nullifying the standard mega buster until it's disabled individually. Other items include the Step Booster, which provides you with faster climbing capabilities, up and down ladders, and even the Energy Saver, which acts off any required amount of special weapon energy, worth 5 and 6 bolts respectively, not to mention the Super Recover, the Spare Charger, Hyper Slider, High Speed Charge, the Rapid and Boost parts, and finally the Exchanger. And as ever, you'll need as much of these items as possible, if not every single solitary one, as soon as you can conserve enough bolts for each of them. Good luck, Mega Man! <laughs> yeah, whatever, Roll! <laughs> That's no good!
In terms of the new Robot Master's choices of weapons when you eradicate their heavy metal asses, Grenade Man's Flash Bomb, Clown Man's Thunderclaw, Tengu Man's Tornado Hold, Sword Man's Flame Sword, Search Man's Homing Sniper, and Astro Man's Astro Crush are amongst the most useful I've ever taken advantage of, as I'm sure many have, notwithstanding the latter's colossal energy usage, like most Green Nuke type special weapons in previous outings. Frost Man's Ice Wave isn't too goddamn shabby, and Aquaman's Water Balloon leaves God knows how much to be desired, unless you're aware of its firing patterns, but are all in all a moderately diverse line. Up. Shit, you can even use the Thunderclaw as a grappling tool to advance through obstacles, akin to Super Metroid, as well as the Tornado Hold for a levitation aid, apart from the Mega Ball. Just like in the previous outing, an intermission stage ensues upon retirement of the first four Asswipe Robot Masters. As such, you're exploring the plains at sunset, during which you'll eventually come face to face with one of the attacking meteor like robots, Duo, who, prior to a sudden disappearance, was briefly researched by Dr. Light when the first four evil energy sources were rounded up. And while we're at it, there's boss cameo appearances by Cutman within that very same vicinity prior to reaching his oversized ass, as well as Woodman and Searchman's area. But as usual, I digress. <laughs> Following said confrontation, or said strings of confrontations, another anime FMV cutscene ensues during which our hero is confronted by a gigantic mechanical gorilla while en route to the underground Wily Tower, protected by a mysterious barrier, by the way, and extremely assaulted by electric shock with the longest and most annoying yell on top of it, one might add. <laughs> You think you'd make it this far, Mega Man? However, I don't have time to deal with you. Say Thank God Duo eventually helps the reckless blue dipshit out of that bind, thus segueing us into the second half of our adventure, which yet again involves lynching the Christ out of the next and final four Robot Master douches. And we all know where this is going. Control-wise, they've been tremendously augmented from its precursor, and are mere child's play as always, sporting something of a modest aspect, notwithstanding the usual batch of gripes about which won't be repeated, including but not limited to the all-new swimming technique. Likewise with the tried and true, often re-established gameplay mechanics, even in 32-bit territory, no less. Challenge-wise, being that it's on the approximate parallel level as its predecessor, it possesses what we like to dub as Gargoyle's Quest Syndrome, and that certain portions of your adventure turn out to be a colossal pain in the ass at the start, not counting the intro stages, which are gravy by comparison, and become slightly more of a walk in the park halfway through. Other than those nerve-wracking, if somehow resilient, jetboard areas about which I've been gloating, the search for the hidden extra bolts is more of a head-scratcher since, yet again, they can't be farmed for, nor is there any fucking way to backtrack for them in case you happen to make it past the checkpoint without any prior knowledge whatsoever. I'm looking at you, Clown Man, in which instance, there's no other alternative but to revisit the stage from square one upon clearing it. And the less I say about the labyrinthine sections in Astro Man stage, let alone the underwater navigation and miniboss confrontation in Aquaman stage, the better! On the former, you're best off using the color-based buttons to activate each door in order to nab a few of the bolts, or reach the giant skull warp mat leading to the next virtual area. Hell, at least Tengu Man's air fleet infiltration via Rush Jet, alongside Beat, Auto, and or Eddie, and even the bubble flight sections aren't much of a migraine, provided you're aware of your unmarred judgement, and neither are the teleportation boxes in Clown Man's stage. Not to mention, since there aren't any E-Tanks here, as elaborated previously, nor are there any super adapters, you'll be relying on the Rush Health more often, which for the record, are only available once per goddamn life, even during the fucking Wily Boss confrontations, no less. And since we're on that subject, they're all complete lily-livered fucks, despite their significant ranks and aggression factors in comparison to the retarded-ass Robot Masters, whom, as usual, you'll have to quarrel with again near the end. First, there's Atetemino, a chained mechanical ladybug that appears from above with a box and two cylindrical hatches that release bombs in the style of Whack-A-Mole, susceptible only to the Mega Ball. Blinking, a gargantuan tin-plated rocket-like combat droid armed with mines, homing missiles, a row of six lasers emitted from its limbs, and the ability to ram into any and all opponents. 
The long-awaited return of Bass and Treble, fused with each other as always. An updated slime-based Green Devil, based on the Yellow Devil, whose abilities and patterns should be second nature to us by now. And finally, Wily himself in two forms, his 8th machine variation complete with a huge laser and a saw blade, followed by the usual capsule with an arrangement of purple energy orbs. And yet again, as usual, we all know where the fuck this is going. It's no wonder why Capcom fumbled the goddamn ball with the boss confrontation difficulty for shit's sake, if not egregiously. Thank god, however, as also mentioned previously, at least all your weapons are refilled not only upon death, but in between stages. Since this is a PlayStation game we're dealing with, you're able to save your progress upon clearing any stage, or following your final demise, thereby keeping track of all the weapons you've gained, the extra enhancement items you've gotten a hold of, and the necessary bolts you've discovered for them so far. Ditto for the Saturn counterparts, as long as you've got your memory card or random access memory, RAM for short, cartridge equipped for their respective consoles. Beyond that, take every ounce of advice provided thus far to art, while retaining those of the first seven. In the graphics department, for a 32-bit update to the Blue Bomber's legacy in commemoration of his 10th anniversary, well, at the time, of course, the in-game visuals are crisp, vivid, and well-defined, all in terms of three key factors – stage foreground and background work, scenery background work, and sprite work alike. Mega Man by himself, in-game, isn't too tacky or oversized unlike last time, despite his more detailed and elaborate animations being on the awkward and oafish side, as are the much simpler foes. I'm glaring at you again, Mets. Shit, the choreographed close-ups of each character engaging in plot-heavy in-game conversations don't disappoint a smidgen, especially Proto Man, no less, who, for the record, appears at rare but crucial intervals. While many might be turned off by the slight overhead view of every stage area, duels hold to the likelihood of complications stemming from enemy targeting and pinpointing every goddamn environmental danger, it's far from a godforsaken eyesore and then some. The same could also be said for the stellar, if not surprisingly dated, anime FMV cutscenes, especially the intro, containing two different songs for both the Western and Japanese editions of the game, with the latter by a band called Ganesia, titled Electric Communication and Brand New Way at the end, thus giving the game more of a dynamic anime-esque edge, produced by Zabek of Sorcerer Hunters, Zoids, Love Hina, the Mega Man NC Warrior anime series based on Battle Network, Dean Angel, Stelvia, Negima, and Martian successor Nadesico fame, also responsible for the cutscenes in X4 out the same damn year, Maverick Hunter X on PSP, and its bonus OVA movie, The Day of Sigma. You can tell right away that they upped the motherfucking ante on the overall presentation, thanks to the appearances of the newly devised and more diverse choices of foes, big and small alike, and even the use of slightly darker hues in contrast to the brighter ones, thereby shitting uncontrollably on those of the earlier seven installments, if quite frankly not by much. In the music and sound department, arranged and orchestrated this time around by Shusaku Uchiyama of Resident Evil Director's Cut, Resident Evil 2 and 4, Devil May Cry 1 and 4, PN03 or Product Number 3, and Under the Skin fame, as well as the Japan and Europe-only Saturn port of X3 and Mega Man 10, alongside composers from various entries, the soundtrack, in all honesty, is a mixed bag. Not that they blow burrito and turkey chunks in the least. Sure, the CD quality songs aren't as noteworthy, poignant, or enlivening as the likes of the first six NES outings, as well as seven on Super NES, to some goddamn extent. And especially the soon to be elaborated X4, hence one of the most common complaints for this one outing alone, considering why many tend to look the other way very often. And that's understandable, but at least each and every track fits the mood of their respective incidents, if not rigorously. The sound effects are at least more realistic and up to snuff, despite being a skosh out of whack, and the voice acting, Christ shitting damn, doesn't leave a lot to be desired, except maybe in game. I'm almost finished. The battery will be charged in 10 minutes. That's good. By the way, what do you make of these? These? Seems to be energy resources, but I've never seen this type on Earth. I don't know where this energy came from, but you cannot let it fall into Dr. Wowie's hands. <laughs> you must recover all the energy immediately, Mega Man. When we find that meteor, we'll find Dr. Wowie. Take aside Mega Man's almost kitty but girly nature, rivaling even that of his sister Roll. Dr. Light, however, is way off due to his quote unquote Elmer Fudd inspired Yankee motif. Uh, nothing against Jack Evans, who also voices Otto and Frostman. <laughs> I'll crush you! I will beat you! The participating Robot Masters are yet another mixed bag, while Grenade Man, Tengu Man, and Sword Man are at least competent, likewise with both Base and Proto Man. Kid, you're almost not worth the effort. 
Everyone else runs the gamut from flat out nonsensical to just downright aggravating as shit. And the less I say about duo, the better. Oh, and kindly take note of our top 10 songs shown here with an honorable mention at the bottom. Replay value wise, ranking slightly higher than both 6 and 7 combined, and while the same adaptable mechanics and kinks make their return here, while incorporating its own share of innovations, in juxtaposition with the safe feature and surprisingly manageable learning curve, there's no denying that there are a fair amount of indispositions revolving around this game, several of which, for the sake of briefly epitomizing what's already been set in stone while preventing myself from echoing them to the point of overabundance, include the absence of content from prior outings which could have worked better here. See what I was getting at? The lack of originality and charm here as opposed to the the mixed bag audiovisual presentation facets, and to top it off, the obvious staff scarcity in terms of not having a competent and worthy enough playtester concerning those godforsaken jetboard sections, for which I strongly suggest giving yourself enough patience and confidence due to the countless deaths you'll suffer, as hinted previously. Regardless of these prevalent grievances, however, there's also no denying that Mega Man 8 is a hair above average, and definitely worth giving a test drive if you're curious enough about what it offers. And once again, before I forget, this is also included in the Anniversary Collection on PS2, Xbox, and GameCube, alongside the previous 7 installments, and especially the Legacy Collection on not only PS4, but also the Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PC, alongside 7, 9, and 10. <laughs> My god, sounds like he should join the Peanuts cast or something. Continuing on with the X spin-off canon, these three follow-ups are set during specific time periods, like with the previous three, in 21 X, following X3. Yet again, let's examine each individual premise one at a time without going too far off the map. In X4's case, an all-new strict, by-the-books, anti-maverick military regime by the name of the Repo Force was originated, thanks to the efforts of the Colonel, his sister Iris, and the oversized Reploid General. What's their mission, one might ask? The strong need for independence from their human creators, despite their intent to prevent any harm towards them. Regardless of their aim, however, yet another chaotic, full-scale struggle breaks out between them and the Maverick Hunters themselves, not just X and Zero, who in this entry's case, their story-driven paths are separate from each other depending on who you start with from the get-go. Mega Man and Base much? On a kind of recently resurrected shadowy figure lurking behind the scenes, <coughs> obviously Sigma, <coughs> who, in order to have both X and Zero deceased permanently, coaxed the Repo Force General into believing how aggressive they are and will stop at nothing to crush their high and mighty regime. And continue to hunt down the Reploids. Do you believe they pose a significant threat? Perhaps. You already know the truth, General. Their sole mission has been to destroy any Reploids who fail to do as the humans order. Your best interest to stop them now before they turn on you. You possess enough power to destroy them. I will not betray the humans. Remove yourself from my sight. My business with you has concluded. <laughs> Very well. But you will change your mind soon, I assure you. <laughs> Sigma, dream the hell on. Anyways, Zero, however, goes through his own share of horseshit regarding a nightmare he's experiencing involving his mysterious yet familiar creator, <coughs> Wily, not only complimenting his appearance upon awakening. Who are you? My masterpiece. But who are you? After him, he is my nemesis. Our rivalry is what gets me motivation in life. Now go, destroy him. That's an order. But. 
but also tasking him to wipe out an unknown foe prior to his eventual disappearance. Whilst attempting to do so, however, Zero then finds himself being stunned by the most catastrophic and shit pain imaginable, thereby transforming into a myriad of mayhem-filled visions. Those same visions also come true in reality, as a colossal floating civilization known as Sky Lagoon makes its descent while being set ablaze, thus savagely colliding into another city lying far below and eradicating a massive mixed colony of civilians, humans, and reploids alike in the process. Mm. Again. Hence, their separate fates come into play. Then in X5's case, the Maverick Hunter base has been laid under siege by an all too familiar enemy, namely that very same dickhead Sigma, thereby not only nuking said base, but plaguing the entire planet with his new virus, thus forcing every Reploid on Earth to go Maverick. And to top it off, a new Maverick Merc in town hired by Sigma, namely Dynamo, has caused the extremely affected Eurasia, an off world space colony, to initiate a devastating full on concussion with the Earth, thereby totaling themselves to absolute jizz all. In an effort to expeditiously cease such an incident, the Maverick Hunter team, made up of not only X and Zero, but also the debut of leader and tactical genius Cygnus, weapons engineer and mechanic Douglas, for crying out loud, is this really the time? And communicator slash computer operator slash navigator slash specialist Alia, the latter of whom you'll hear from a lot throughout this game, as well as in the subsequent follow ups, considers two feasible substitute plans either A, design a high powered laser cannon, Enigma, for test firing, or B, launch a space shuttle into Eurasia. Shit, Cybernator much? Thus vaporizing the ever loving Christ out of said rampaging off world colony and sparing our beloved planet in the process. And finally, regarding X6, taking place three weeks later following said collision, X is summoned yet again to investigate this quote unquote nightmare phenomena lunacy, minus zero due to his third extinction in a row last time around, hence why we see X holding his saber on the cover, obviously, considering the fact that the Earth's far from inhabitable due to Eurasia's recent collapse, meaning that all of humanity was forced to live underground, however the hell remaining there are. Enlisting the assistance of Isaac and his associate High Max, who, in truth, are subordinates under the command of Gates, lead researcher and mastermind behind the Nightmare Virus, it turns out that there is a purple, nightmare-based entity on the Rampage, whose identity resembles that of Zero, within the midst of all this goddamn cataclysm. Ergo, the three initiate a cost for the Replics to once and for all reverse the effects of and vaporize the still-sustaining virus. Of course, it's just a question of whether or not the efforts building towards it cause will be for the greater good. Despite retaining the garden variety, middle of the road copy and paste formula from their three antecedents, you're free to pick between X or Zero at the start in both the cases of X4 and X5, in either the normal or Falcon Armor incarnations of X, but only following the intro stage. Upon selecting either one of the two, or again just flat out commencing in X6, their respective premises play themselves out in either FMV mode, akin to that of the opening, or in game graphical backstory accompanied by text, which by the way, you're able to skip to your leisure. From there, the standard intro stage runs ensue depending on which installment you're dealing with. In X-Force case, you as X or Zero are infiltrating the quote unquote initially normal but eventually ravaged Sky Lagoon, rough with tomboyed ass dragonfly like reploids, not brave soldiers and the like, whilst evading or occasionally countering the metallic winged dragon known as Oregion. <laughs> Eventually, you'll meet face to face with Magma Dragoon with some important, if a tad unnecessary, words before reaching the next area of the same civilization, where, with both ascending and descending landscapes alike, trap blasts, and the usual enclosing walls containing an extra life and an instant refill item, thus segueing into a full on altercation with the very same Aragion. <laughs> Following said battle, the Rebel Force Colonel makes his in-game debut appearance, thereby engaging in a conversation between him and either X or Zero about their suggestion to disarm his regime, to which the former announced new character declines. Then in 
X5's case, you as X or Zero, once again, are on about, rushing and raising all kinds of hell through another urban cityscape setting, on the aforementioned Eurasia no less, rife with ziplines which you can cling onto by holding up on the D-pad while sleeping, floating and falling platforms, mad taxis, walk shooters, crushers, and the like. And remember the whole mid-stage hint communication spiel with Alia I was getting at earlier? With the exception of X5, during which you're better off enduring all her ramblings, you can either push select to access said hints, or ignore them completely. And new to this offering and X6, you can also duck at will, a well-deserved addition in my book, notwithstanding the fact that it's been implemented late in the series, in addition to the traditional ground dash technique. At the end lies a gigantic, rocket-powered Sigma head, hidden within a statue, before which a barely exhausted Zero pops out of nowhere, that is, if you're playing as X. Finally, in the case of X6, you as X alone, this time armed with Zero's iconic Z Saber, are once again traversing through an extremely desolated and foobar desert area, followed by its underground ruins, filled to the brim with junkroids, hover gunners, and two types of obstacles and enemies that can be obliterated with only the Z Saber, namely the metallic boxes and metal wheel Fs. <laughs> After evading a host of rocket-powered drills, two altercations ensue, one against the D-1000 Mechanoloid and its operating core, followed by High Max, with the latter turning out to be absolutely unwinnable. Just like Vile in the first Mega Man X, you're left with no other fucking alternative but to nearly sacrifice yourself. <laughs> Timax then warns X to fuck right off, and more of the plot gets revealed thereafter. Following their individual introductory scenes, each installment incorporates the traditional quote-unquote exterminate eight mavericks in any predetermined order spiel, but with a twist, that is, in the cases of X5 and X6. Our latest crucial roll calls of target mavericks waiting for a serious ass-kicking, one might ask? In X-Force case, you've got Web Spider, Cyber Peacock, Storm Owl, the aforementioned Magma Dragoon, Jet Stingray, Split Mushroom, Slash Beast, and Frost Walrus. <laughs> Then in X5's case, there's Grizzly Slash, aka Crescent Grizzly, Squid Adler, aka Vault Kraken, Izzy Glow, aka Shining Hotarunius, Duff McWhalen, aka Tidal Makhaleen, The Skyver, aka Spiral Pagation, Axel the Red, aka Spike Rose Red, Dark Dizzy, aka Dark Necrobat, and Matrex, aka Bird Dino Rex. And finally, in X6's case, there's Commander Yamark, Rainy Turtleoid, Shield Sheldon, Blizzard Wolfang, Blaze Heatnix, Infinity Maginian, Metal Shark Player, and last but certainly fucking not least, Ground Scaravage. By now, everyone knows the drill. God help me if I fucking meet someone who doesn't. The only exception regarding X4 is you're stuck with that one character throughout the entire game, no matter who you started off with, and are unable to swap between the two like in X3. Not to mention, Zero's way more fluid thanks to his iconic Triple Slash combo, and exhibits an all-new, remarkable moveset all his own. Thank God, and Capcom, of course, he's not as faulty and restricted as he used to be last time. Despite how tough it can be to get the hang of his basic techniques, even during the Maverick boss battles, no less, it completely shits on X's path in terms of diversity, being that not only is he assisted by Iris, again, the Colonel's sister, as well as Zero's eventual romantic interest, a set of contemporary skills are introduced upon laying the ultimate smackdown on each new Maverick, likewise yet again in every subsequent outing. For instance, Zero can apply different elements to a saber while either on ground, during a dash, or in mid-air, as well as perform both a Giga Attack-inspired screen nuke, hence Cyber Peacock's Rakuoha in X4, Izzy Glow's Sea Flasher in X5, and Infinity Maginian's Rekoha in X6, and an air dash, hence Jet Stingray's Hian Kyaku in X4, and Squid Adler's Ice-based Frost Flasher in X5, thus integrating a plateau of challenge beyond anything one's ever witnessed. As for X, the usual choices of weapons are applied as always, upon making each new Maverick his bitch every step of the way. Several notable ones include Split Mushroom's Soul Body... Okay, we're not going there... Web Spider's Lightning Web, also used as a temporary wall obstacle to avoid spike areas, akin to Gargoyle's Quest. 
Storm Owl's Double Cyclone, Magma Dragoon's Rising Fire, which when charged results in the iconic Shoryuken, cause once again Capcom. Disguiver's Wing Spiral and Dark Disney's Darkhold, aka the X version of Flashman's Time Stopper, also available for Zero. Commander Yamark's Yamar option, which summons a formation of three Dragonflies around X, thereby trumping Daisy Glow's Firefly Laser, if not by much, as well as Metal Shark Player's Metal Anchor and Blaze Heatnix's Magma Blade. Ok, now I see yet again why Capcom never bothered to apply more diversity and innovation to the weapon choices in both X5 and X6, thus making the series go to complete shit. But what the hell, their singularities pretty much speak for themselves. As per usual, 8 heart tanks are hidden within all the Maverick stages depending on which character you started off as, though in the case of Zero, however, you'll only end up with 7 plus a 1 up, in conjunction with 2 sub tanks, 1 weapon tank, the debut of the EX tank, which provides you 2 extra lives by the by, and all the ultimate armor enhancements for X, a few of which let them hover for a brief period before descending, charge up your special weapons, thereby deducting a great amount of their energy, summon 4 fully charged X Buster shots in a row, or a volley of extra large plasma powered spheres, which inflict a great deal of damage to your opponents, and even summon the mid air Nova Strike when its energy has been filled to the brim thanks to the customary crap tons of heavy projectile damage he and Endures. There's even the fourth armor, aka the Force, which X starts off with from the get go in X5, Falcon, Ditto, and X6, containing a Giga attack in the form of plasma shots. Gaia, with which X can't be harmed by spikes despite being hindered from using any special weapons and using slightly powerful arm cannon shots that travel at least halfway through the screen, similar to Samus's default beam in the original NES Metroid, Black Zero, and even the two types of armor enhancements in X6, Blade and Shadow, between whose differences one has yet to comprehend. Concerning the other objectives in both X5 and X6, there are hostage reploids who are in need of rescuing in order to partly refill your health, or in the latter case, supply you with various parts to further improve your efficiency depending on your desired character. Of course, there's 16 individually named ones in each Maverick stage area, with 5 that handle the part supplies according to Alias Rescue Log, accessible in the stage select portion of X6. Hell, in X5 you can acquire enhancement parts from certain bosses and or said rescued reploids in distress, unless you've already set the difficulty to easy beforehand at the beginning. While persevering through each mission, you'll have 16 hours before Earth gets ravaged by Eurasia to procure said crucial parts for the newly crafted Enigma laser, and even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dynamo at certain intervals, starting upon elimination of the first two Mavericks, as well as Nightmare Zero and XX, depending on which stage you'll randomly pop up in, whose defeat results in unlocking the real Zero, who's stuck only with his unchargeable arm cannon. Every time you start off in and or clear an area, at least an hour is withheld regardless of whether or not you succeeded or failed, though the former might award you an extra one, thereby overthrowing the purpose of in-game exploration and analysis entirely. In X4 and X6, however, thank god there isn't any of that horse shit, but at least you're able to take on the Colonel twice if you're playing as X at the Memorial Hall after wiping out the first four Mavericks and your the Rebel Forces spaceport after wiping out all eight, respectively. I've been waiting to fight with you. However, you can only face them once as Zero, despite containing a cutscene after eliminating the first four Mavericks, during which they duke it out, eventually cut short by Iris, forcing both him and the Colonel to part ways. Too late. Stop the coop now! Never. If that's your decision... PREPARE YOURSELF! Stop! Please! Brother, please! Don't you remember? Zero saved my life! Very well then. I'll spare your life for now. But next time, there'll be no mercy. Following that, the actual spaceport confrontation doesn't occur until the next four, that is, all eight Mavericks, are retired, thus further culminating their individual fates. From there, the last threat of missions aboard the final weapon ensue, as well as those of the Zero Space Cyberspace Anomaly Fortress at point 11F5646 due to Eurasia's collision with the Earth in X5 and Gate Secret Lab in X6, and well, the long and short of these journeys should be far more than second nature by now. Notwithstanding how loose and crippled the controls can be at times, in terms of jump timing, anticipating the moment of releasing your most powerful bursts, and even Zero's abilities, be they basic or learned from retired Mavericks, not to mention those third-rate post-attack recovery times he endures, or that loathsome as fuck Namco syndrome from which he suffers regarding the latter type techniques performed by inputting the specific D-pad and triangle combos, let alone while in mid-air. And let's not get ourselves started about those goddamn 80 on ride chaser sections, which are 780 million times more hair pulling than the snowboard areas in Classic 8. I'm looking at you, Jet Sting. And Squid Adler and X4 and X5 individually, and trust me, I'll get to those in no time. They're not that much of a fucking hassle as opposed to the likes of, say, Batman Forever, Super Pitfall, Lester the Unlikely, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or God forbid, Karate Champ. 
Anyways, prevailing digression habits aside, the often rehashed but still refined gameplay formula doesn't disappoint in the least, with maybe the exception of both X5 and X6 combined. Concerning the challenge aspects for X4, X5, and X6 combined, while this trifecta of 32-bit thrills is on the same approximate level as the first three X offerings on the Super NES, running the gamut from standard to just downright nauseating as shit, Jesus Christ 69ing a wild buffalo while being trapped in a glass pool, drowning in Kevin Costner's urine samples with two bayonets shoved up both their sadomasochistic asses, don't expect these installments to tend to both your physical and mental wounds long enough. Regarding the various locations for the armor capsules, subtanks, and other semi-mandatory finds, while some are in plain view, others will test your perception in ways you've never goddamn imagined. For instance, the two subtanks in both the Marine Base's second area before reaching Jet Stingray, to which you've got a dash mid-jump whilst on the Adeon Ride Chaser, and in Cyber Peacock's VR space after getting an S rank in terms of clearing a specific area, or in Zero's case, nabbing a hard tank and or the X tank in Frost Walrus's snow base, for which you need Web Spider's Lightning Web. Ditto for the X-Buster capsule in Storm Owl's Air Force facilities, or double jumping as Zero, and the less I say about the body armor capsule in Magma Dragoon's volcano area upon disintegrating the fuck out of the rock piles with the charged rendition of Slash Beast Twin Slasher, the better! I mean, it's like there weren't any visual cues for said strategy. As for those in X5 and X6, God help us if they don't speak for themselves well enough. In tandem with rescuing almost every reachable in distress reploid, some of which end up turning maverick if affected by the virus entities, or are far from worth a motherfucking effort due to their locations running the risk of a possible death. Like, seriously, Capcom, what the Christ? Oh, and once again, don't even get me goddamn started with the bombs in the Skyver's Air Force stage that will cause a pissload of damage if you don't defuse them in time. Well, in X5's case, at least. Let alone Blaze Heatnix's infuriating as nuts magma area, during which you're not only tasked to overcome the usual torch hazards while keeping the nightmare virus creatures at bay, being distracted by indestructible flies and the most futile poise that very few could put into words, and rescuing more of the distressed reploids, you're also forced to contend with the Nightmare Snake, aka what many refer to as the Red Donuts of Doom or the Red Rings of Bullshit. I'm looking at you, Quartz guy, complete with four beam cores that fire off green spheres five times in a row, FIVE MOTHERFUCKING TIMES, and one of which involves evading a sea of purple flame no goddamn less, which rear their ugly ass noggins on as many occasions as the infamous ride chaser sections, and believe me, they'll trip your ass up time and time again if your senses weren't up to snuff. But that's not the worst of it all, oh shit no. Other than the spaceport and final weapon scenes that occur in X4 after retiring all 8 Mavericks, which are a blessing by comparison in terms of stage-by-stage -stage progression for the record, the Zero Space, Cyberspace, and Gates Lab areas in X5 and X6 respectively, my god, they're both pure exercises in endless annoyance and resentment, coupled with ultimate tests of attention and patience beyond description! And I shit you not, it makes even the entire Super Star Wars trilogy look like a goddamn endless sequence of park strolls. Anyways, in the very first area of the Zero Space Fortress, you had to use Dark Dizzy's Darkhold to temporarily cease the instant death lasers whilst traversing through the second half, cause as ever, you'd be pissed out of luck if you weren't prepared or well versed in the style of Quick Man's area from Mega Man 2, thus otherwise excessively shitting all over its challenge in the first place. But then again, it might just be the camera's fault. From there, other trials and tribulations include roaming through super long zip lines, combined with the usual falling and floating platforms, while avoiding extensively long spike beds. However, these are gravy compared to the horseshit Gates Lab can and will provide in X6, regardless of who the hell you are or which armor type you're experimenting with. Case in point, there are these diagonal lasers that you can pass through despite the tip end of their burst dealing slight damage, much unlike those in X5, thank god, but only serve as an extreme visual disturbance than anything considering there are other douchey-ass foes to deal with, not to mention the slow as molasses auto-scrolling section of that very same area with rising fire on the bottom which can drag for minutes on end, as well as the isolated platforms and structures looming over a bottomless pit that'll have you signing 800,000 death warrants non-stop if you came into the area as X without either as Falcon or Gaia armor equipped, let alone their respective supporting parts. Shifting our way back to X4, the individual boss lineup depends on whether you started off as X or Zero, in the case of Final Weapon Area 1, but it's still virtually identical nonetheless, given that you've already gotten the hang of their individual skill sets. <laughs> I'm gonna recycle you! If you've reached the end of the first Final Weapon Satellite Fortress area as X, you'll end up confronting Double, yes, the very same clumsy-ass rookie hunter slash assistant who's been guiding you all along, when in clear as day reality, he's a fucking double agent, uh, no pun intended, of course, with the intent of gathering inside info from both of the hunters, Whereas with Zero, you'll end up confronting Gyrus, same case as before, except she summons an attack mechanoid as a sign of vengeance towards Zero for the murder of her brother. Forgive me, Zero! Hurry, 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 hurry. 
Regarding the latter, upon Iris's eventual demise, the biggest right hook to the gonads' plot twist kicks in, during which Zero laments over her death by his own brand of brute force. Thus, he unwittingly loses his shit. Hence this iconic cutscene. Stay away from Repliforce. Let's live together in a world where only Reploids exist. Iris, there's no world just for Reploid. It's only a fantasy. <sighs> Iris! 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 Ah! No, this isn't happening! There's no reason for me to go on! What? What am I fighting for? Christ, talk about heartbreaking. Following this, they even confront the General, who, notwithstanding my slight attention issues, I'm able to vanquish with next to no static. I mean, seriously, look at what a towering pussy he turns out to be! What with those rocket platform fisty dishes out, in addition to those large blue energy spheres of his. And lastly, the standard Maverick rematches via teleporter procedure takes place, where, by the way, you'll always end up starting at even after you saved your game, or revisited a previously conquered stage area to farm for more tank refills, or acquire any left behind enhancements or extra items, likewise in X5 and X6. Following which, isn't it fucking obvious? The unfittingly long awaited return of that conniving, low down, pussy ass, vermin chomping, son of a bitch bastard douchefuck Sigma himself, in full Grim Reaper garb no less, with both a standard Reploid armor thereafter, and the ultimate three tier gauntlet which shits on those of the previous three, and especially the next two combined, specifically two differentiating forms of Sigma, one with a colossal laser cannon whose firing patterns are as random as speed dating, and only contains one line in this form. <laughs> yeah, the end my ass. Whereas the other appears on the ground, in the form of only his distorted, wire-wrapped face, whose only means of assault are luring you towards the spike walls with its gust of wind, and definitely not the flatulent type, mind you all, oh fuck no, and choking up chunks of debris, while being heavily guarded by three element-based metallic heads, blue for ice, red for fire, and yellow for lightning. Articuno, Vaporeon, Moltres, Flareon, Zapdos, and Jolteon, meet your new roomies! As for X5 and X6, yet again, individually, there's the Shadow Devil, another Yellow Devil homage of a variation, except the theme is taken straight from the very first and original 30-year-old classic, whose only means of assault involved materializing itself into two 8-block towers, and catapulting its celluloid blocks side-by-side -side before reappearing, as well as firing red energy orbs from its peeper, and, in some cases, taking the shape of the Wily Machine Mark VI in Zero Space Area 1, the all-new Rang the Bang the W in Area 2, which displays the same attack operations as the other variation from the first Mega Man X, except it summons spikes from not only the floor, but also along the sidewalls at random when half-defeated, not to mention a sunlight orb that anticipates every move you make, which is also a possible weak point aside from the three main colored eyes, in which case, equip X with a fucking Gaia armor beforehand, and a face-to-face -face altercation between you and your ally in Area 3. For instance, X faces Zero and vice versa. In the Extreme Ladder title, however, the aforementioned X6, that is, you'll end up facing that persistent-ass Jagoff Dynamo, again, through something of a wild goose chase within previously embarked Maverick stage areas, each of which results in the pigeon-hearted pussy warping from one area to the next until he ends up throwing in the goddamn towel, followed by the debut of the Nightmare Mother DNA masses that migrate from wall to wall, horizontally and or vertically, stopping every once in a while to expose their eyes, their only vulnerability areas, by the way. Of course, your best weapon and or zero technique to use on them is the Metal Anchor from Metal Shark Player, or Raku Kojin, low on the latter's normal Z-Saber, the return of High Max, with the same old blue energy orbs, small and big, and as lethal as fuck shield barriers, not only in a random Maverick Nightmare Investigator area beforehand, but in the second area of Gate's lab. Then there's Gate himself, who's known by all to be one of the most infamously reviled motherest of fuck faces in all gaming history, Duels Holtz's arena setup. <laughs> X. In terms of the six platforms looming over yet another chasm, which randomly reappear upon being destroyed when he's near death for the record, not to mention the wide array of attacks he displays, in other words, the various Nightmare Hole attacks depending on the five possible colors they appear in, as well as their appropriate quantities, red resulting in your character slowing down while Gate has the upper hand on you, shit, Crystal Snail and X too much, orange for long-range energy spheres, blue for a magnetized vortex trap, often resulting in an accidental plummet, green for long-range homing orbs, and purple for summoning the Nightmare Viruses, not to mention shift from one angle to another while you're normal offenses do jack shit, and summon wide purple dark energy rush, thereby neutralizing said reappearing platforms, thus evolving this nauseating, red-ass worthy altercation into yet another extreme, all-consuming, vomit and hysteria-inducing, subconscious raping test of patience unlike anything the free world's ever fucking witnessed! Thank God, however, following said confrontation, Sigma pops up out of nowhere and deals the final blow to that manipulating, dick-faced motherfucker once and for all. Uh, 
悪魔を復活させたよシグマをねああ調子に乗るな小僧あの程度では死なぬわお前の助けなど必要なかったわ邪魔だ切ろう
but in an egregiously appalling poise. It's no wonder that Capcom shat the bed once again when it came to the lack of innovative gimmicks and habitual rehashes of old content. I mean, god shitting damn. All in all, in spite of what they were hoping to accomplish with this kind of tactics, X4 and X5 outshine the bejesus out of not only their three precursors, but X6 also. As always, must I go on any motherfucking further? In the music and sound department, composed for all three installments individually by the returning Toshihiko Horiyama, also of Demon's Crest fame, and especially the PS1, Saturn, and PC ports of X3 alongside Uchiyama and Tomozawa, the misadventures of Tron Bon and Onimusha 1 and 2 fame, the indestructible trio of Naoto Tanaka, later of the infamous X7 and X8, with the latter being not much of a shit fest, Beautiful Joe, Red Hot Rumble, and Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney fame, Naoya Kamisaka, and Takuya Miyawaki, the latter, again later of X7 fame, alongside then newcomer Shinya Okada, and of course, the earlier stated Tanaka himself. The CD quality audio doesn't disappoint by a fucking long shot. Each individual song featured in these three entries possesses their own mirrors of moods that make them stand out from one another, and a whole lot more. Granted, while X4 is considered by many to contain the most uplifting and emotional soundtrack in the 32 bit era, thanks to its variety laden choice of songs, X5 and X6 don't pull any punches either. Sure, most of the latter two games' songs reuse various tunes from those that came before them, I'm looking at you yet again, Shadow Devil, and that a few of their newer themes are guaranteed for many to look the other way due to the repetitive, uninspired nature they possess. But you've gotta hand it to these four maestro masterminds in attempting to breathe new life into every correlating incident, whether in game or during plot specific cutscenes. And since we're on the latter two subjects, the text crawl tones can drone over within the span of at least a minute and a half, if possibly longer, with or without any music whatsoever. Shit, do we even need to mention the godforsaken voice acting sound bites yet again? Apart from the always realistic and intense sound effects, at least those heard in game are much easier to stomach than in those infamously localized cutscenes, in X4's case that is, regarding only Zero, Sigma, Colonel, and Iris, and X5 and XX's overall arrangements of newly introduced characters. But when the two main Maverick Hunters appropriate action based voiceovers are initiated over and over, including their own individual near death quotes in X4, I might add, and I listen to these very carefully. Time to get serious. It's not over yet. That's totally the last god shitting damn straw. Another mind blowing fact regarding the voiceover features is that the same English language actors and actresses chosen for Mega Man 8 were also cast for X4, considering yet again that both were released at the same time. And as ever, take note of our top 6 songs per installment shown here, with a few honorable mentions showed beneath them. Replayability wise, need I say more about the lasting appeal of these three 32 bit thrill a minute roller coaster rides? Well, in X4's case, you're free to experiment with the same separate side stories of both hunters, and especially Zero, as I elaborated a while ago, due largely to the tremendous amount of challenges Path will provide in comparison to X's, both of whose high level armor enhancements are unlockable via secret codes, likewise in X5, as well as the time draining exploration procedures in which they engage. And in spite of the head scratching plot loopholes, not to mention the return of those sudden zigzagging difficulty curves, we're looking at you again, Mega Man 3. It's no surprise that you'll be warping and rushing back into both this and X5 time and time and time again. Or for the sake of avoiding any static, notwithstanding the merits and extra content X6 offers, its obvious cons far outweigh the shit out of the pros, many of which I brought up already and then some, which is why I strongly suggest steering clear of just that one offering alone. As always, these three are on the X Collection for the PS2 and GameCube, about which I also advocate referring back to X2 and X3, but other than that, your best bets for an ultimate 32-bit experience are X4 and X5, on the haul. Jenna. Last exhibit of the lineup, folks, Mega Man and Base, circa 1998 for the Super Famicom. And don't think by now I'm not aware that there's that Screen Crunch Game Boy Advance port released half a decade later. The 
Future Fisher, this is for you. Say that you're following the events of 8, whose graphical capabilities this offering takes after, by the way. A power-hungry, dark-hearted, robotic being known as King, with a firm yet asinine belief of his own kind considered to be superior to all humanity, Sigma meets your new BFFF, not only breaks into Wily's lab, but also into the Robot Museum, God knows why it's still even here, to snatch away the blueprints for his and Light's Robot Master designs, with the intent of amassing and constructing his own army for... <laughs> isn't it obvious? FUCKING WORLD DOMINATION! Ergo, as usual, our ever-so-capable Blue Bomber Avenger is called into action once again to foil the insidious plots of this newly introduced, gold-armored shit-for-brains arch-nemesis, while Base strives to achieve the same objective in order to reclaim Wily's rightful surroundings in his honor. However, only one will emerge triumphant. Gameplay-wise, not only does the ever-so-recycled, yet refined formula mirror that of its 8 foregoers, there's another restriction borrowed directly from X4. You're stuck with your desired character throughout the majority of the game, regardless of who the fucking hell you start off with. Technique-wise, while Mega Man displays the customary skill sets as before, Base Packs won all his own. In addition to performing a ground dash akin to X and Zero, he can double jump in the style of Sega's Jewel Master and even monster in my pocket by Konami, and rapidly fire off his Base Buster while stationed akin to Gunstar Heroes, or in midair and tandem with aiming in seven possible directions. Okay, now I see why many prefer the latter character more. The intro stage they each go through is virtually identical, and is a homage to various memory lane-worthy elements from its many predecessors. For instance, you got the mole drills from 2, the tackle fire particles from 1, the rainy setting along with the gravitational pushing wind from 4, and the like. Eventually leading up to the Robot Museum, during which King starts even more bullshit by not only savagely offing the ever-loving fuck out of Proto Man, but also unleashing and bringing back a slightly more threatening Green Devil from 8, who, in reality, is still an absolute goddamn invertebrate. Neutralize the oozing shit out of that oversized son of a bitch, and the standard Robot Master body count procedure kicks in, starting with Cold Man, one of three possible preliminary choices before moving on to the latter five, namely Ground Man, Burner Man, Pirate Man, Magic Man, and Dynamo Man, with Astro Man and Tengu Man making their unexpected albeit triumphant return from the 8th offering. While it's almost a cinch to snuff his frigid ass with Mega Man himself, Base's attacks require a fuck ton of effort due to his shots hacking off a single solitary damage point per hit, and can't be registered until your target recovers. And since we're yet again on the subject of the traditional boss confrontation setups, you'll need much more than just your brute force and determination if you expect to stand any chance against King's minions, let alone all the catastrophically fucked up trials and tribulations both have to go through in order to reach those insufferable as balls pricks, rivaling those in 1, 3, 5, and X3 combined. As ever, the Bolt Currency System makes its return, since you're once again able to farm your ass off in every goddamn area like in 7, as does the Item Shop, this time run yet again by Auto, which contains nearly the same items as before, except a few new additions have made the catalog, in tandem with base's own enhancements. Take note, regarding the second panel in the pause window, the first row of 7 items work automatically, whereas the second row of 8 have to be selected in order to activate them, but only one of them can be used at a time. However, I'll get back to those eventually. By the way, remember that pause window I was talking about with all the items you've bought so far? There you go. Anyhow, upon annihilating that cock-sucking, cold-hearted asshat, his eyes wall becomes available to you, as well as the spread drill and copy vision from offing both Ground Man and Astro Man individually. In other words, bye-bye Astro Crush. <laughs> Aside from the bolts for extra items, you can also discover and round up CDs scattered throughout various stage areas for info on any character, including all the Robot Masters from previous outings, and the Robot Killers, as well as the Star Droids from the five Game Boy spin-off installments, which, in full irreversible honesty, turn out to be a slew of enthralling, if sometimes hokey, content, despite its obvious lack of importance to the plot or the gameplay procedure for that matter. Shifting gears back into this current iteration's new gang of Robot Masters, with two returning from Ace, as indicated earlier, not to mention the immeasurable odds above which either our eponymous Blue Bomber or his rival turned ally must rise to pursue the fuckers. While some turn out to be a shit all walk in the park, everything else, I shit everyone not, is so crush forsaken volatile that they'll rape your mind worse than the Ludovico technique in a Clockwork Orange, and an endurance trial of riding the same local theme park roller coaster 30 times over combined. On the latter, Burner Man, Ground Man, Magic Man, and Pirate Man are perfect fucking examples. Dynamo Man, however, pretty much takes the goddamn chicken parmesan deluxe with a side order of onion rings with jalapeno and marinara sauce, and that he'll always refill his energy mid-battle. Christ, Doppler from X3 much? 
Regardless of who you started with, however, attempting to take on every robot master with only your normal buster weapon alone is near fucking suicide and will leave way more than a dent on your ass, thanks largely to their strictly erratic as fuck patterns and the massive damage you'll sustain. Though in Basin's case, they'll take way more than Mega Man, thereby rendering him a paperweight in the process. That is, unless you're an elite strategist in terms of dodging. And as always, don't expect any fucking E tanks or rush adapter gadgets here like an 8. If you're playing as Mega Man, however, you're able to heal yourself using Eddie from Auto Shop, as he'll supply refills as usual, like Rush did, of course, in 8. Too bad basic supplies are severely lacking in the Eddie department, on the other hand, though his triple boost can be very advantageous thanks to his ability to fly after merging with his pet, like we've seen him perform in the previous two. Amongst every other hint of guidance I've administered so far in relation to every Mega Man game elaborated upon up to this point, do yourself a humble ass favor and restrict yourself from overusing the required weakness weapon ammo prior to and during each confrontation, cause let me tell you right now, you'll end up pissing away your chances at a surefire triumph. In other words, your previous checkpoint is at the boss hallway with said required weakness still being impoverished. And above all, always nail these confrontations right on the first try or consider yourself in for the most critical fucking penalties to which I'm in no position to elude at this point. Regarding the latter, specifically the infuriating ass bullfuck level design, they're virtually the same shit we've seen throughout the series, except it's increased to its maximum goddamn intensity level, reveling even that of the very first NES outing, and especially 3 through 5, as well as X3 fused together. Running the gamut from the standard mandatory mini bosses, namely Snowler the Snowman and Cold Man Stage Area, the giant Muka Muka Day Centipede and its two servants in Ground Man Stage Area, the four unit Move Cannon in Dynamo Man Stage Area, and even the returning Shishi Roll from 8 in Magic Man Stage Area, as well as all those cerebral rape worthy puzzles, including the stoplight patterns in Astro Man Stage Area over which the Melody Response Cannon looms, which, if followed wrong, will activate said weapon of mass destruction. Of course, you're free to proceed after you follow its light patterns the right way, as well as the spiked pillar from Sword. Man stage, lowered upon the defeat of each living Kao Nagana statue, and to top it all the fuck off, the most unpredictable and arbitrary enemy collisions and outbreaks that rival even the likes of Mission Impossible for the NES by Konami and its ill-fated Ultra Division, Vector Man 1 and 2, Street Fighter 2010, another Capcom classic, and the 7th Saga by Square Enix and the short-lived Produce, rolled into one. I take this golden opportunity and buy myself some blood pressure meds if I were you, cause this game will test your composure in more ways than one could possibly imagine. As ever, should you have it to outlast this excruciating abundance of hair tearing horseshit, it's on to King's Fortress, whose own slew of double whammies don't even compare in the least. As far as the usual controls go, they have their multiplicities of issues depending on whom you've chosen in the first place, as well as their enhancement items, which can only be equipped one at a time in the case of this iteration, regardless of its benefits, but can take a vast deal of time to get used to. The level design, however, is yet another different case entirely. I mean, it's like while they were intended to be indigenous to Mega Man's physical potential, in reality, most of the new domains are designed specifically for base, and to some, it can turn out to be either a sublime blessing or a heinous, near irreversible as shit curse, which is why many coined this, as well as the earlier discuss 7 and 8 as the series quintessential black sheep, well to some extent. Either way, the gameplay procedure is still enthralling, fast paced and critical at times, albeit immensely jejune and overplayed. Regarding Mega Man and Basis Challenge, everything I've hinted at so far, and a whole lot more, definitely lives up to this department. Therefore, I willfully advocate referring back to my previous two statements for the sake of evading my redundant ass tendencies. More than that, another set of differences between both Mega Man and Base, the two characters that is, not the title. Setting aside their aforementioned physical capabilities and their individual enhancement items intended specifically for themselves, is the difficulty curves they'll experience depending on who you've picked at the start, and this is where their strategic trade-off comes in. While Mega Man's offensive attributes are almost top-notch, regardless of which confrontations he indulges himself in throughout, his agility is for total shit due to his lack of mobility, hence why I mentioned that there aren't any rush adapter aids, not counting the surge of course. In other words, expect an assload of near impossible leap of faith moments, including but not limited to the row of balloons that pop upon landing in Tengu Man's new domain, not to mention close calls when being exposed to and or dealing with hazardous areas, hence why he's considered by many to be this game's hard mode. Base, on the other hand, is not only extremely agile thanks to the previously hinted double jump and ground dash abilities, as well as the treble boost, his overall platforming tactics outdo those of the Blue Bobber, despite his inability to slide, thereby becoming an easy target for oncoming foes in the long run. And what's even more fucked up, Base could barely hold his own during any mid-boss or main-stage boss confrontation due to his lack of a shot charging ability, which he makes up for by purchasing the Hyper Blast whose shots travel through walls unlike those of his normal buster. 
Getting back to the newly introduced available items from Auto Shop, some of which are also included upon waxing the fuck out of select robot masters. They include the enemy analyzer for indicating the weaknesses of any and all bosses by a special commentary from Rawl, worth 50 bolts. The return of Beat, who provides the user with a temporary blue shield for instant invulnerability, worth 300 bolts. Basis High Speed Dash, worth 100 bolts. The Comm System, also worth 100 bolts. And most importantly, the CD Counter and CD Finder, worth 100 and 300 bolts respectively. A certain fraction of which are either essential or useless as family advice and a near empty canister of air freshener, in which case, rely more on the former. Despite these, however, it's also a total buzzkill that the weapon energy isn't refilled upon death unlike in 7 and 8, regardless of who you've chosen, and that the checkpoint system from previous iterations has been completely fucking nullified. Jesus, Teddy twisting Christ in a shoulder hold with a fireplace poker between his scrotum. What the shitting fuck was Capcom on when they decided to make such asinine horseshit changes like those? On the upside, however, at least you're able to save in between stages via the old battery backup method, thereby recording all your progress. Moving on to the dreaded King's Fortress and its three intensely merciless as fuck sections, be prepared for more of the same catastrophic encounters you've experienced time and time again, except yanked all the goddamn way up, higher than every tower and skyscraper in the world stacked together. Take my advice as well as that of everyone else, bring as many lives as possible, of course the maximum being 9 cause Capcom. The same Gabiol, Gory 3, Fire Mets, Energy Barriers, and various enemies make their endless appearances waiting to have their circuits shoved up their one-sided asses, rife with hazards ranging from acid falls and spike pits, one of which can be avoided by riding on ice blocks from the machine, and isn't it obvious already? The motherfucking end bosses. For starters, there's the return of Atetamino, this time on a conveyor belt machine, tethered to a platform over a goddamn pit of lava, guarded by a miniature gore with a shitload of rocks. Oh, and be sure to jump right the fucking Christ off of that very same platform upon its demise, cause it'll instantly lower itself right into the godforsaken lava pit. The King Tank and King Plane, both of whose confrontations can take a long ass duration to endure due to their respective offenses and trivial weak points, specifically the former's main front turret that deploys 5 bolts of gunfire and occasionally bombs in tandem with the rear hatch that dispatches the little romper toy soldier droids that start all kinds of shit by paralyzing you upon contact, and a top hatch that deploys those same bombs while the tank occasionally charges into your ass if you're on the same fucking floor, in which case stay underneath whenever possible. While well, the latter unleashes not only a light ray via its red crystal, but also a volley of fist missiles and rows of bubbles, some with life and weapon refills contained within, whereas others can and will contain mines of light that leave you temporarily blinded for at least a second while you're constantly jumping on a shitload of platforms looming over a never ending bottomless pit, a few of which, again, can and will be destroyed by those very same fist missiles. Take note, if you entirely contemplate on surviving the King Plane confrontation with Mega Man, your only saving grace is just his wits alone, due to not having any flight support aids unlike base, as well as the boss's once, maybe twice in a rare blue moon decision to forego his fist missile attack. Eventually, you'll face off against King himself, following a marathon of said encounters. Prior to which, Proto Man flies in and deals with a hypocritical ass piss ant douchebag, resulting in not only a shield being savagely ruptured, but Proto's overzealous ass becoming temporarily comatose due to the overuse of his Big Bang Strike. Following his near demise, King nonchalantly tests the waters about why robots always fight against each other for humanity's sake, to which our two main heroic mofos point out that they created them in the first place and deserve to be highly respected. And get this, it suddenly turns out that King was the creation of- Seriously? Dr. Fucking Wily? Ok Capcom, let me get this shit straight. Not only was the series main jackass antagonist the inventor of this heartless, soulless, four flushing son of a bitch, he was abruptly booted the Christ out of his own goddamn fortress due to said achievements, only to drop this huge quote unquote H-bomb of revelation that he was running things from the get go? Fuck, even yours truly, or Manta Ray aka Lava Buster Vasquez of Zeratopolis fame could come up with much more convincing premises than this! Anyways, King arranges one final confrontation aboard his Jet King Robo, a hybrid of both the tank and plane, which, thank god, is a complete fucking joke as opposed to the shit you had to go through earlier, regardless of who you've initially chosen, but it's not over yet. 
Yet another stagnant marathon of boss rushes and obstacles rains down upon us in the form of this game's latest, and say it with me now, Wily Fortress area. The same 8 Robot Master Deuce rematches apply, except in a predetermined sporadic order like in both the very first classic game and the first X. In tandem with the same patience and sanity testing, superfluous bullshit we've seen over and over, during which you're better off grinding constantly to keep your own ass alive, and your necessary weapon ammo and helper energy to its absolute fullest prior to each confrontation. Wily himself and his usual 2 form machine from 8, however, can be way more of a goddamn tormentathon compared to 7 due to the lack of energy recovery tactics. Well, at least in Base's case, no rhyme intended. Though, despite Mega Man's reliance on Eddie, he'll either provide the same refills as before, even at the heat of the moment, or more bolts, thereby leaving your ass in the motherfucking dust in the long run for no apparent reason. From there, if you manage to yet again cream the psychotic ass twat faced wanker prick as either of the two, their respective outcomes differ depending on whom you've chosen from the get go, which, for the last time, I intend to S choose spoiling at this point. Holy blood pissing fuck buckets! It's no wonder Capcom was this fucking militant when it came to the overall development and design process, resulting in and giving rise to arbitrary as shit cases of luck based progression concerning this particular goddamn iteration alone. <sighs> As ever, refer back to the invariable advice we've been providing for each and every other iteration we've deliberated over thus far. Frankly, the graphics aren't much to write home about, especially for a super late 16 bit update, no pun intended, which only saw release in the old Land of the Rising Sun, not counting its infamously ported Screen Crunch GBA counterpart we promised Land folk were stuck with. But they're still vibrant, whimsical, alluring, and detailed as ever, animation wise, of course. Taking full on cues from Mega Man 8, there's barely been any real changes from its predecessor, and many might be turned off here by the relative yet initial sizes of the two titular protagonists in comparison to the remainder of the screen area. However, it's not all cramped, unlike that aforementioned second rate Game Boy Advance port, and the stage backgrounds have at least seen another well deserved renovation, thereby shitting on that of both 6 and 7 combined. A few notable instances include, but not limited to, the trains and bell machines and control of various foreground elements in Magic Man's domain, based on Clown Man's Stage in 8, the color based explosive boxes in Dynamo Man's domain, based on Grenade Man's Stage in 8, the aquatic scenery of Pirate Man's domain, with certain assets based on and inspired by Aquaman's Stage in 8, except with parts of a sunken ship discovered underwater, and the cliche ass piles of gold with pots and treasure chests seen at the end, and even the natural botanical rainforest scenery of Burner Man's domain, based on Search Man's Stage in 8. Sure, many might yet again look the other way, given the circumstances of this replication tactic, but it's no secret that each and every visual element is a scotch less colorful in comparison to 8, for better or worse. But then again, I'd be bullshitting if I said otherwise. The sprite work of the newer adversaries doesn't disappoint either, and that the same diverse range of attitudes and principles have always been applied, just like those in their predecessors, and a whole lot more. I mean, for fucking out loud, even at this juncture, I don't see any goddamn reason to go on any freaking further. Oh Christ, no. In the music and sound department, orchestrated by Naoshi Mizuda of Street Fighter Alpha and Resident Evil 2 fame, Final Fantasy XI alongside Nobuo Uematsu and Kumi Tanioka, Parasite Eve 2, Blood of Bahamut, as well as Final Fantasy XIII 2, 14, and Dimensions 2 for Square Enix, and Akari Kaida of Night Warriors Darkstalkers Revenge, Mega Man Battle Network 1 and 5, both Team Proto Man and Team Colonel, Cyberbots Full Metal Madness, Dino Crisis, Onimusha 3, and Okami fame, under the supervision of the returning Horiyama, the new themes in complete honesty are our mixed bag, but are far from stale and uninspired. Granted, the soundtrack's in no way, shape, or form on par with the first six NES offerings, thanks to an entirely new, albeit familiar style which almost virtually mirrors that of its 32 bit precursor, but to paraphrase Han Solo, they've got it where they count, kid. The sound effects are the same as ever, nothing to cream your knickers over much, but at least, uh, I don't know, there isn't any perturbing and dense as fuck voice acting here unlike in 8 or X4 through X6. For the sake of fairness, however, my top 8 songs are as follows The Robot Museum Intro Stage, Auto Shop, The CD Database, Cold Man Stage, Astro Man Stage, Ground Man Stage, Dynamo Man Stage, and finally King's Fortress, all three areas. Replayability wise, need I fucking say more regarding Mega Man and Base's longevity in an unbreakable nutshell? Considering everything I've expressed so far, not counting the data CD collectibles or the returning Volt for Currency farming routine from 7, now I see why many turn away from this game a lot, due to the insane, skull cracking difficulty level it offers, as well as the removal of feasible mechanics that worked in previous iterations. Not to mention, although it's intended to be a Mega Man game like all the others, the various in game elements are, and can be, extremely haphazard and inconceivable to take advantage of thus forcing you to accomplish a shit ton of inhuman undertakings that felt as rewarding as in every other entry, hence why, as established before, they're designed strictly for base alone. 
Regardless of which character suited you best, applying such a crude ass difficulty level isn't and should definitely not be any way to restrict or scale down their overall physical capabilities feasible for a nagging set accomplishments. Bottom line, for the sake of inadvertently but summarily dismissing these and more commonplace objections, you're better off with the original Super NES aka Super Famicom version, being translated or otherwise. But whatever you do, steer clear of the Game Boy Advance port like a maximum security system at a faraway prison. By presiding final verdict on these 20 timeless classics deliberated on so far, words cannot express the boundless appreciation and praise, or in some cases qualms, for such an ever maturing, if at times capsizing franchise that's been carrying its immortal legacy for three straight decades and still going strong, notwithstanding its eight year absence. And I know what everyone's thinking. I've been mindlessly praising every single solitary Mega Man iteration as if there's something special about them that make each other stand out, right? While it's in my true nature, and that's a given, as I succinctly pointed out with 8, even I can't deny that there are significant flaws about each and every single goddamn installment covered thus far. Regardless of what they are, however, whether it's the sudden, zigzag difficulty curve of 3, the overused gimmicks of 4 through 6, the underwhelming, albeit new soundtrack of the second Game Boy spin off outing, the annoying ass, out of place voice acting in a few of the 32 bit entries, or the mind numbing, patience testing, high difficulty levels of certain titles, looking at you for the last time, Mega Man and Base. On a scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate them all. Taking these statistics into consideration, however, if you're on the hunt for such unforgettable, breathtaking, intense as shit, balls to the wall, action platforming adventure antics, and explosive, havoc filled dramatic mayhem like nothing else, I cannot, cannot recommend both the Mega Man and Mega Man X franchises enough. For those that haven't experienced them in the flesh up until now, consider yourself having made the biggest, near irreversible mistake in the history of all time, space, and creation rolled into one by missing out on what Capcom's iconic Blue Bomber and Maverick Hunter have to offer, and then some. Need I remind everyone yet again that they're not only available within their respective collections, namely the Anniversary Collection on PS2, Xbox, and GameCube, and the X Collection on PS2 and GameCube, but also on the Legacy Collection, Volumes 1, concerning the first six NES iterations, and 2, in terms of 7 and 8, alongside the unforgettable 8-bit tributes, those are 9 and 10, and even the Virtual Console and PlayStation Network, including, but not limited to, the X titles. Trust me, regardless of your preferred systemic means, ancient or modern, even Splatoon, Gears of War, and Modern Warfare won't have shit on the infinite, staggering epicness that is Mega Man, Classic, and X. Before I go, I'd like to take this golden opportunity and thank these wonderful specimens for sticking by yours truly and embarking on yet another unforgettable journey of a memory lane trip with none other than that puts every fucking SeaWorld and Universal Studios theme park ride in history to absolute shame and once more then some. The delightful wife and husband duo of Sarah Rowe and Matt Michael Stone, Mrs. and Doctor respectively that is, New Hampshire guitar impresario Matt Lister, alias M. Defala, my 16-bit heroic partner in crime Ian Bergeson, also from the band The Offseason, whose music I suggest scoping out as well, the rowdy yet reserved Riley Sky 100, and finally the bumbling Lord Bifflecup and the mysterious British intellectual Oaf who joined yours truly and the aforementioned Sir Lister, in the place of facepalm of course. Come on, where's the applause here? Great, just what I was expecting. Anyways, until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off.
Thank <laughs> you.